We mentioned a word about the hope of heaven. So I was thinking as Pam was singing that song, that is where our hope lies. Spending eternity with the Lord. And I was thinking as Pam was singing, she was singing about waiting at the river. Brother Jeremy sings a song about look for me at Jesus' feet. I got to think about that. Well, wait a second. We're going to be at Jesus' feet. We're going to be waiting at the river. And I thought, well, the hope of heaven is the hope of heaven. I mean, it's, the, it's being with the Lord. And I can imagine the writer of the song Pam just sang one day, perhaps being down by a river. Now, I don't know the circumstances. I'm making up a story. But it's a good story, and i got an imagination, so I'm going to use it. Perhaps they were down by a river one day, and they looked across and said, one day across the river, I'm going to cross the final river in my life. I'll be in heaven. And God began to minister to their heart over the hope of heaven and used a river to do it. That's, I say hallelujah. Amen. And then one day, perhaps the writer of the song, and, and I don't know who it is, Brother Richard may know, but, uh, and he may know the circumstance, I don't know. Uh, perhaps the writer of the song that Brother Jeremy sings, look for me at Jesus' feet one day. Maybe, maybe they had bowed down. Or maybe someone had bowed down at their feet. And at that moment, they realized that one day they were going to get to bow at the feet of Jesus. And God began to minister to their heart over the hope of heaven and involved bowing at the feet. You see, the fact is, both cases, God ministered to their heart over the hope of heaven. And so I can rejoice over being at his feet. I can rejoice at being on the river's bank. I can rejoice of walking down the golden street. I can rejoice about my mansion. I can rejoice about seeing him. I can rejoice about seeing my loved ones, Brother Choi. There's just a whole lot of rejoicing in heaven because heaven is the hope of the child of God. Thank the Lord for that. Well, amen. That is the last positive note in the preaching today. Uh, so go with me to 2 Samuel chapter number 18. I'm teasing a little bit. There's positives in, in the preaching of God's Word because sometimes God uses preaching to help us. Sometimes He uses it just to lift us and encourage us. But I'm trusting the Lord to do a work in our hearts today. I've got a burden. We've got a burden that the Lord would help us and, and really touch our hearts. We've got several families in the church that have young children. They're raising families right now. I'm one of them. I'm raising a family. Some of you have already raised your families and some things that I touch on today may be sensitive to you. Because the fact is, if you have raised a family, there's one thing that you all have in common. You have regrets. Uh, I, I don't know of anybody that has raised a family that looks back on the years of raising children that do not wish they did some things differently. I don't know anybody. You have regrets. And I may touch on some things today that bring up some sensitive areas in your life. And if so, I want you to know I'm not preaching about your life. I'm, I'm trying to help those that have not yet got to where you are. And if I can get one family today to turn to the Lord and keep them from having one more regret... We've all got regrets already. I'm raising my children. I've got an 18-year-old, 14-year-old, 7-year-old, and a 6-year-old. I'm in the raising process. You say, well, you got one that's 18. I understand that. You say, well, you can just let her go. <laughs> More power to you if that's your attitude. I can't let her go. <laughs> Amen. I mean, the, the physical picture does not meet the emotional picture, Brother Marcus, and you're going to find this out. Now, see, you had a boy first and a girl second. I had a girl first, and it's different. That don't mean you love your boys less or anything like that. It's just different. Girls need a daddy to protect them. Amen. Amen. Boys you raise to protect their daddy when he gets old. <laughs> but girls you raise to always protect. And uh, the physical picture is not there, but if you could see, if you could take my emotions and draw them out on paper, and I just want to tell you this is the truth, if you could draw my emotions on paper, there would be a stick figure of a girl and a stick figure of a daddy with both arms and both legs wrapped around her holding on. 
And all the other stick figures that are boys walking around, you're going, get away, get away, get away, get away, get away. If, if you could draw out my emotions. That's just the way I am. I'm raising a family, and I already have regrets. But if God would help us to make a decision today, to get help today so that I could have one less regret, I would consider this a very successful service. And if someone today who's already raised a family could get help that maybe they could pass on to their children and they would have one less regret, I would say this is a success. And if there's someone here that maybe you have regrets and you could learn how to better handle those regrets and turn those regrets over to the Lord, I would consider this service a great success, and I believe the Lord would as well. So I want you to stand with me as we go to 2 Samuel chapter number 18. We're going to read one verse. I mentioned this to the church a little while ago just in passing. I did not go into detail with the message because I did not have anything developed at that time, and the Lord was not leading in that direction. But I mentioned this verse and just a couple of thoughts uh, several weeks ago, but I want to read it again. I want to preach a message with the Lord being our helper. We're dealing with walking through the woods of Scripture. Last week I dealt with the woods of peril or the wood of peril where Jesus had multiplied times reached out to Israel, reached out to Jerusalem, reached out to His people and offered them peace and offered them protection and offered to do something for them. And the Bible said and ye would not. That's a perilous phrase. And so much, so many people today saying the exact same thing. Last week was a message about humility and hypocrisy and their heritage and their help. Today, by God's grace, I want to deal with the wood of parenting. If you are a young parent and you're raising a child, I want you to listen with both ears and especially an intentional heart today because I believe the Lord will help you. And if you're here today and you've already raised a family, I want you to listen and I want you to get something to take to somebody and help them. Somebody's going to ask you some advice one day and I want you to be able to take God's Word and help them through this. So would you please listen and pay attention today with all of your might. Verse number 33, first, or 2 Samuel chapter number 18, verse number 33. The Bible said, And the king was much moved and went up to the chamber over the gate and wept. And as he went, thus he said, O oh, my son Absalom, my son, my son Absalom, would God I had died for thee, O oh, Absalom, my son, my son. Heavenly Father, I pray your blessings upon the reading of your word. I ask you to help me. Lord, you know me. You know my uprisings and my downsettings, Lord, as I prayed early this morning, Lord. I prayed Psalms 139, verse 23 and 24. Search me, O God. Search me. Try me. Lord, see if there be any wicked way in me. I believe, Lord, I've dealt with anything and everything. And I'm asking you, Lord, to please take me and use me as a vessel to preach your word. Lord, I have no ability of my own. I offer myself at your disposal today to be used for your glory, and I pray you do it. I ask you, Lord, to guard my lips. Help me to say everything I should say and nothing I shouldn't. Lord, would you help us to listen intentionally today and help us today to get help from your word We'll bless you and thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Thank you. You can be seated. I want to read the verse again to you, and then we will get into the message as we deal with some other areas of Scripture. The Bible said in the king, this is, of course, David. Absalom has died, and we'll get into that story perhaps in a bit. But Absalom, his son, has died, and the king was much moved and went up to the chamber over the gate and wept, and as he went... Thus he said, O oh my son, Absalom, my son, my son, Absalom, would God I had died for thee, O oh Absalom, my son, my son. We have the cry and the prayer of a heartbroken dad in verse number 33. We're dealing today with the wood of parenting. And, and when I mentioned this last week, we're dealing with walking through the woods of Scripture, W-O-U-L-D, all right? And uh, there are some woods 
that we need to pay attention to in the Scripture. And this one today, David said, Would God I had died for thee. I want you to notice this in our passage of Scripture today. This involves a relationship. Several times there, I believe four, maybe three or four, maybe even five times, David said, My son, Absalom, my son, my son. He ends the verse with, My son, my son. He is declaring a relationship between himself and Absalom, the one who has died. Can I offer you today that this relationship between a parent and a child is a God-given relationship? This is not something that has been ordered by man. It's not something that mankind think, thought up. It's not something that man evolved into. This is a God-given relationship. And when we think of parenting and we think of childhood, it needs to be approached as a God-given relationship. The Bible said in Genesis chapter number 1, verse number 27, So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. And God blessed them. And God said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. When God created man, God created within man the ability of procreation. And not only did he say you had the ability to procreate, he said you have the responsibility of procreation. So I offer to you today the relationship between a father and a son or a father and a daughter or a mother and a son and a mother and a daughter is a God-given relationship. And it should be approached as such. When God gives us something, it is not something to be taken for granted. It's not something to be taken lightly. It is something to take very seriously when God is gracious enough to give us something. So it's a God-given relationship. Secondly, I offer you this morning, it is a grace-given relationship. Can I tell you there is nothing that I have found outside of two things, salvation and my marriage companion. There is nothing that I have found greater than being a parent. And I do not think my children will be offended by that statement. They know where I stand. Amen. There, is, there, there are two loves above my children. And please, please don't get upset. My children know this. Your children ought to know this. Many of your children don't know this, but they ought to know this. I love the Lord God number one. He is the number one. I love the Lord down deep in my heart, however you want to say it. He is the number one love of my life. That is the the Lord God. He is my creator. Not only my creator, he is my savior. He is the friend that sticketh closer than a brother. He's the one that will never leave us nor forsake us. So brother Ken, I love him most of all. But secondly, the second love of my life, hands down, no competition, is Mandy Biddy. Right back there. She's my wife. She is the number two love of my life. I make no beans about it. You say, you mean you love her more than your children? In the presence of my two oldest children, emphatically, yes. Amen. 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 Some of your kids have never heard you say that. And they ought to. Because guess what? One day you raise your children to leave home. Is that right? I mean, we're all raising our children regardless of the jokes we make about the emotional attachment and how much we don't want them to leave and all of that. That's what we're raising our children for. I remember one time we were talking about all this and Mandy said that we raised them for this. I said, yeah, but why? (laughs) Amen. Sometimes you begin to question yourself. We raised them to leave. And guess what? When they're all gone, she ain't going, Brother Ken. She's still going to be there. And you need to invest your time in your wife. And wife, you need to invest your time in your husband because one day the kids are not going to be there to hold your relationship together. Right now what we've got, you've got a husband on one side and a wife on the other and a string of children in the middle that's holding mama's hand and holding daddy's hand and that's the only connection that mom and daddy's got. Hey, listen, what you ought to have is a mom and daddy standing in the middle and kids strung out on the sides and mom and daddy holding hand and saying, hey, not a child, not a dog, not a cat because praise God, you got to preach stuff like that today. Not a dog, not a cat, not a child, not anybody, not a big 
business, not a church. Nothing is going to get between me and this person because that's my love. Amen. That's not the message, but it's true. So I have two loves. And then after my wife and after my Savior, I love my children. Brother Henry, I cannot, I cannot express how I love them. I've never been able to express how I love Mandy. I've never been able to express how I love my children. Brother Nathan, I love them. Oh, I love them. So there's something in me that compels me to love them. I trust that my children know that I love them. I never want them to question or doubt whether or not I love them. And, and what I'm trying to get back to and point your attention to this, when God gave you a child, when God gave you a child, it was given by the grace of God. You say, well, preacher, what about the people that God has chosen not to bless with a child? God has given them a grace to never experience the grace of having a child. I can't explain it any other way. I know a lot of people don't understand that, but Brother Troy, there are people today who cannot have children and never will have children. God blesses some of them with the adoption process and thank the Lord for that. God blesses them in other means, but there are some people happily serving the Lord who have never been able to have a child and God gave them grace to never have the grace of having a child. But I say children are given by the grace of God. And I bless the Lord for that. My children are given to me by God's grace. And by the way, along with the grace of God giving me a child was the grace God gave me to raise that child. To love that child, to nurture that child. The Bible says in Psalms 127, verse number 3, Lo, children are an heritage of the Lord, and the fruit of the wound is his reward. As arrows in the hand of the mighty man, so are children of the youth. Happy is the man who hath his quiver full of them. They shall not be ashamed, but they shall speak with the enemies in the gate. Hey, it was a happy day when I figured out I had a four-child four quiver. I got a four-child quiver. They some have three children quivers. They some have 18 children quiver. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> and they're happy with their quiver. I mean, they are blessed because their quiver is full of children. But you know what a four-child quiver would be with 18 kids in it? Very uncomfortable. <laughs> and do you know what a one a, a, a four-child quiver with one child in it would be very empty and lonely. But God in His grace, and this is why I believe that His children are given by the grace of God, because in His grace, He can give a man an empty quiver and never have a child, and that man can be satisfied and happy in the Lord Jesus. He can give a family one child, and they can be happy and satisfied in the Lord Jesus. He can give them 15 children, and they will be happy and satisfied in the Lord Jesus. Only the grace of God could accomplish such diversity, yet with the same grace. So I say children are grace-given. It is a grace-given responsibility or a grace-given relationship. When Absalom had David, did God know the heartache that would come? Absolutely. God sees the beginning. He sees the end. He sees everything in between. It's already been played out to him. So God knew the heartache that would come. But still, God in his grace gave Absalom to David. It is a grace-given relationship. It's a God-given relationship. So we see this passage in this wood of parenting involves relationships. Secondly, it involves a rebellion. Now, before we jump the gun and say, hey, man, here he goes. He's, whoo, he's fixing to get them kids about that rebellion. The rebellion I'm preaching about this morning is not what you think. I wanted to catch you before you got too happy about that because I hated to bust your bubble once it got so big. The rebellion I want to preach about for just a moment is not the rebellion that first comes to mind. When we read this passage of Scripture and we read that Absalom has died, we say, hey, that's what happens. We, we'll take this passage and we'll point to our son. Son, let me tell you, you ever turn against your daddy, this is what God's going to do to you. You turn against your daddy and you come against Papa and you, you, you start raising havoc around my kingdom. This is what's going to take place in your life. God's going to kill you. It's not the rebellion I'm talking about. I'm not talking about Absalom. Let's go back to chapter number 11. Let's deal with the rebellion. 
that really we have in this passage of Scripture. Verse In chapter number 11, I'm not going to take time to read it all, but you will see, if you have a Schofield Bible, it starts out there with a heading of David's great sin. Probably most of your other Bible, as far as study Bibles, probably have something of that nature in there. Well, this in chapter number 11 is where David sins with Bathsheba in an adulterous relationship with Bathsheba. And then not only does he do that, he goes on to do great wickedness after that. And we'll, we'll deal with that in just a moment. But I want you to notice one of the things that makes this rebellion so horrendous. Notice where this rebellion lies in the life of David. It would be one thing if this rebellion was in front of David's anointing. But Brother Choi, it's after David's anointing. It is after God chooses David to be the next king. It's after God sends the man of God and takes the horn of oil and pours it onto David and anoints him. This is the one I have chosen. And after God anoints David, it's when this rebellion comes. It'd be one thing if it was before David met Goliath, but now David has already met Goliath, and David has walked out onto the battlefield, and David has seen the hand of God come upon him. And with the power of God, David took a sling and a stone and sunk the stone into the forehead of Goliath, and he chopped his head off and held it up, and he chased the entire Philistine army away. Hey, after God had given him the great victory against the Philistines and against Goliath, that's when the rebellion comes after that great victory. The rebellion came after God had protected him time and time again from Saul. David went into the cave and he cut the skirt off of Saul. Say, how could a man do that? He must have been very stealthy. Be hard to wake up when God's singing a lullaby to you. Say, why, why didn't Saul wake up? God wouldn't let him wake up. You see, God's hand has been on David and God is leading David and he is protecting David. Hey, it'd be one thing if this happened before David had drank from the springs of En Gedi and before God had protected him in the mountains of his own creation. But this came after En Gedi and after he drank from those sweet waters. This is after the blessing and after the anointing and after the victories that God had given him is when this rebellion came. It's one of the things that makes it so horrendous. This is after the throne is given to David. This rebellion comes after he is king. This rebellion comes after the ark is brought back. Now the presence of God, the ark where God abides between the cherubims, it's now back in the hands of Israel. It's now back in the proper place. Hey, the presence of God has come back. It'd be one thing if all this happened before the presence of God was back and before the ark of God was back, but it happened after the ark is back. I say all that to say this, when I look at my own rebellion and my own stubborn pride and my own personal failures... It'd be one thing, Brother Scott, if they came before I was saved. It'd be one thing if I rebelled against God, Brother Ken, before he called me to preach. It'd be one thing if I had rebelled against God before he had blessed me with a wonderful wife and before he had blessed me with four wonderful children and before he had blessed me with a church. But Brother Hugh, I find myself in rebellion sometimes even after all God has done for me. Does that not make the rebellion even more horrendous? After all he's done for us, we still rebel. Not only this rebellion in that, that needs to be uh, recognized, but I want you to notice the way things were handled. It wasn't only where the rebellion lies, it's the way the rebellion was handled. What did he do? Well, number one, he deceived he brought Uriah back and treated Uriah like he was a faithful servant. Hey, he was, Uriah wasn't, wasn't offered blessings and offered peace and offered a feast and offered to go sleep in his own bed because he was a good soldier. It wasn't because of his faithful service. It was because David was trying to cover up his own sin. So David deals with his own rebellion with deception. Then David deals with this rebellion with desertion. He sends a letter by the hand of Uriah. And he says in that letter, put Uriah in the forefront, in the hottest place of the battle, 
and then leave him there. Withdraw yourself from him. He deals in deceit. He deals in desertion. And then he deals with this rebellion in death. He does all this to have Uriah the Hittite killed. Murder now on the plate. It's not just a rebellion that, that led him to sin with Bathsheba. Now it is a rebellion that has led him to murder. He is now the cause of someone dying, not in battle protecting his country, but dying for the sin that he committed. It's horrendous. Rebellion. So we see this wood of parenting is about rebellion. It's about a relationship. I, I promise you I'm trying to help you. And if you'll hang with me, we'll get some help in a minute. It not only involves rebellion, it, revol it, it involves a realization. I want you to notice two categories of sin that are mentioned in David's life in chapter number 11. Number one, if we can categorize sin, and sometimes you, you must do that, Brother Nathan, the first category of sin in chapter 11 is sexual sin. When David sinned with Bathsheba, he committed a sexual sin. Then the second category that we have to deal with in the life of David in chapter number 11 is murder. Two categories there, and I say that for this reason, because not only do we have the categories of sin, we have the continual growth of sin, and here's where things get bad. Is this the first time, or is this, the, I'm sorry, is this the last time that sexual sin is going to come up? No. The next time in Scripture, and we can read about it if you want to, but the next time in Scripture... That sexual sin comes up is going to be in verse number 13 or chapter number 13. And I'm not going to go into detail. I know we've got younger people in here, and I'm going to handle this just as gently as possible, but still be a man of God and, and, and preach what needs to be preached. David committed a sexual sin that is horrendous in the eyes of God. I understand that. And I am by no means belittling David's sin or taking away from the horrendous nature of David's sin. But I want you to notice the next sexual sin in Scripture is not just adultery. It now involves rape and incest. Can I tell you there is a progression that comes with sin. And that progression normally stays within its own category. And if it is sexual sin, what happens, that sexual sin continues to get worse and worse and worse. Look at America for a change, if you will. If, if we could just say America for one moment. America started out years ago the most horrendous thing in the eyes that you could see in a politician. One of the most horrendous things that would come out in a politician's life was the fact that they had a promiscuous relationship with someone of the opposite sex. That was horrendous. We could not believe that one of our leaders would do such a thing. But yet now, our leaders vote to make it legal for the perversion of relationships within the same sex. It's in the same category, but there has been a progression within that category, and that is the continual growth of sin. It will always happen that way. And dear parent, I'm begging you to get a hold of God this morning and to rein yourself in and to hold yourself back and to rule your own spirit well because your sin will stay within the same category and it will be worse in your children and worse in your grandchildren if Someone doesn't, by the grace of God, stop it. Amen. Let me stop for just a moment and throw this in because I don't want anybody to leave hopeless. You may say, my daddy was an alter, adulterer. You may say, my mom was an adulterer. And you say, what does that mean for me, preacher? Do I have any hope? Oh, yeah, there's always hope. There's hope in Jesus. Jesus is all about hope. Brother Ken, I'm dealing, I'm dealing with things that if somebody... Absalom made his own choices. We cannot, we cannot take away the personal choice of Absalom and this brother Troy. 
But Absalom was being influenced by Satan because his daddy had opened the door for Satan to come in. Now, Absalom had the choice of closing the door, Brother Philip, and saying, hey, I'm not going to listen to you. Absalom could have done that, but he did not. He allowed Satan to continue to work within the door that his daddy opened. And can I tell you as a child, as a young person, maybe as a young adult, you say, man, my mom did this, my dad did this, my grandparents did this. It's been a long line of sin after sin. It just seems to get worse. Preacher, is there any hope? Oh, yeah. Find the door he's coming in and close the door and nail it shut by the grace of God and say it's going to be different from my generation. It's going to be different from my children. It's going to be different from my grandchildren. He will not re- wreak havoc. But if you don't close that door, he will continue and it will continue to get worse. Let's stay within the category now and let's move on to the category of murder. David had Uriah the Hittite killed. David had a soldier killed. But the next murder that we find is Absalom killing not a soldier, but killing his brother. Would you not agree the murder of your own brother would be more horrendous than the murder of some non-family member? See what I'm saying? Within that same category, the sin continues to grow and it continues to get bigger and bigger and bigger. Did Absalom have a choice? Yeah, he could have closed the door, but he didn't close. He kept allowing Satan to work within the door that his daddy let him in. I'm trying to help you, parents. I'm trying to help you with all of my power and all of all of the ability that God will give me. I'm trying to help you. Hey, listen, dear friend, do not open the door. Your, your children deserve better than that. And if you have opened the door, go back to where it is and shut it and say, I'll never open that door again. You cannot come in that door again. You cannot take my family from me. Amen. It involves a realization Continual growth of sin. It involves a regret. We're fixing to get some help. I want you to go back to our text verse in chapter 18, verse number 33. And the king was much moved and went up to the chamber over the gate and wept. And as he went, thus he said, O my son Absalom, my son, my son Absalom, would God I had died for thee. O Absalom, my son, my son. Can you hear the regret? in the voice of David as he cries out to the Lord. How do you know know this was real regret? It moved him inwardly. What's the first line of the verse say? And the king was much moved. That's not a physical movement. That is something that is happening within the heart and the emotions of David. He is moved within himself over what has taken place with Absalom. Absalom has died and he regrets what has happened in his life now. And now David is crying out, Would God I had died for thee. Oh, Absalom, my son, my son. Oh, Absalom, my son, would God I had died for thee. He is moved within himself. But not only does this regret move him inwardly, it moves him outwardly as well. The Bible said, and he wept. He went up to the chamber. He left where he was and he went to pray and he wept as he went. There is an visible evidence of what is taking place in the heart. I ought to take a moment and just say something about the altar. You know what the altar is for somebody sitting across the church from you? It is visible evidence that God is doing something inwardly in you. And if you won't use the altar, it may be the fact that it may be something that holds them back from allowing God. Hey, listen, the altar was built for you to get help. You say, well, preacher, I can pray just as good silently. Yeah, but you understand the Christian life is not just about you. The Christian life is about your brothers and sisters in Christ. And the Christian life involves you helping others and your obedience to move at the wooing of the Holy Spirit in your heart also encourages others to move at the wooing of the Holy Spirit in their heart. That is why the altar use is so important. It is an outward, vis- uh, uh, outward vision of what is happening inwardly. 
One is acknowledgement. That happens within. The other is action. That happens without. David had both in this regret. Now, I want to say this involves a responsibility, and here's where we're going to get the help. I want you, and I don't want anybody to call me a heretic. Don't say I'm changing the Word of God. I am not. I'm asking you to think about something for a moment. What would happen if we relocated verse number 33 of chapter 18? <clears throat> if we had liberty today, which we do not, okay, this is a story that has taken place, and we're having, we have the account here. But if we had liberty to change history, if God gave us a moment in time and said, you can rewrite the life of David, and I give you the liberty to move one verse in Scripture to rewrite the life of David. And we chose verse number 33, Brother Henry, and we pulled it out of Scripture. And we replaced it and put it somewhere else. Turn back with me to 1 Samuel chapter number 11. What if we put verse 33, if God were to give us the ability and the liberty to rewrite David's life by moving one verse of Scripture, what if we moved it between verse 1 and verse 2? Let's read it. The Bible says, And it came to pass after the year was expired, at the time when kings go forth to battle, that David sent Joab and his servants with him and all Israel, and they destroyed the children of Ammon and besieged Reba, but David tarried still at Jerusalem. Now let's insert verse 33. And the king was much moved and went up to the chamber over the gate and wept. And as he went, thus he said, O oh, my son Absalom, my son, my son Absalom, would God I had died for thee, O oh, Absalom, my son, my son. Then verse 2 would begin. And I wonder how the story would change. And it came to pass in an eventide that David arose from off his bed and walked upon the roof of the king's house. And from the roof he saw a woman washing herself, and the woman was very beautiful to look upon. I wonder if he had prayed verse 33 between verse 1 and verse 2. Brother Ken, his sin was not seeing Bathsheba. It was a common act for someone to walk upon the rooftop. That wasn't uncommon. It was also a common act for people have talked about Bathsheba should have covered herself and shouldn't have been. That was, a, that was a common act. That's what they did. That's where they bathed. Adam walked out on the roof, or David walked out on the roof and he looked down and he saw Bathsheba. But I wonder if he'd have just got out of the prayer closet praying, would God I died for my son. Brother Nathan, would God I die for my children. I wonder when he saw Bathsheba if he'd have just turned around and said, oh God, Crucify my flesh. Let me die for my children. Let me live a crucified life. Go to Galatians 2.20. I know you know it, but I want you to read it with me. I want you to see it from God's Word. Galatians chapter 2, verse number 20. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. In the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I wonder if David had prayed to die for his children before his children died, if it would have changed the outcome of David's story and the outcome of his children's story. Well, here's the thing. We're reading the life of David, and you can't change it. God has not given us the liberty to change the life of David. But he has given you the opportunity to change your own life and to change the life of your children. We can't go back and put, would God I had died for thee, in between verse 1 and 2 of David's life, but this morning, you could go back and put it between your verse 1 and verse 2. But you see, something is coming or has already come that if you don't handle it properly, it's going to affect your children and their children and their children and their children. And by God's grace, I trust that if you will not deal with it, that one of your children will. 
Here's the problem. Stand up, son. The door I open, I open in his life. I only open one door in my life, but I open a door in his life. Ashland, stand up. The door I opened, which was singular, one door, Brother Ken, I also opened in her life. And if Teeb was in here, I'd get him to stand because, Brother Nathan, the door, the singular one door I opened in my life, I also opened in Teeb's life. And that one singular door that I opened, I also opened in Tinsley's life. So when I opened that door and allowed Satan to do that work in my life, guess what I did? I opened four more doors. And here's the sad reality. I do not have the ability to close but one. The only door I have the ability to close, son, is the one in my life. So, son, if there's something comes up in your life because of me, be a man and close the door. Okay? Ashlyn, if there's something that your mother and I have opened up and it opens up in your life, it's time to be a woman. Close the door. Close the door. And I have to tell the, the young children that too, Brother Ken, because I can only close one. Thank you. You can be seated. Thank God for restoration. Thank God for forgiveness. Thank the Lord for His grace to close the door in your life. But your children need your prayers. Because the grace of God's going to have to be real in their life for them to close the door. Would to God I died for thee, Absalom. Some of you young families, I'm begging you to hear the word of God today. You can still move verse 33. Your life has not been written. Your story has not been completed. We're not reading an account of what has happened. You are living what is happening. Go now and get your verse 33. Get that death verse. Get that verse where you're going to be crucified and put it back in your life and say, I am going to die for my children. I'm going to die for them. I'm going to die to my own desires. You know why Park and Rec football and baseball and basketball and soccer is so popular today because so many parents didn't make it. And the fields are filled with boys and girls living out their parents' dream. Half of them are miserable. They don't want to be out there in the middle of August sweating like a hog. Hey, listen, man, if you don't love hitting somebody and trying to take their head off, being out there in a helmet and football pads is torture. Now, if you love taking somebody's head off, man, it's wonderful. Sweat all day long for the opportunity to hear that crack. But if you don't love that, it's terrible. And the parks are filled with little kids running around trying to be the superstar that their daddy could never be. Amen. Little girls in short skirts and pom-poms falling on the back of their head because they're no more athletic than their mama was. <coughs> Trying to live out their mom's dream. Amen. Wouldn't it be a real blessing if some parent would just say, by God's grace, I'm going to die today. I'm going to die to my own ambition. I'm going to die to my own desires. I'm going to die to what I want in my children's life. And I'm going to live solely for the purpose of raising my children for the glory of God and whatever God wants for them and whatever God wants for me. Let's stand to our feet.